Okay, Hebrews 12, first part. This may prove to be timely as I'm reading through this. I'm like, wow, this actually speaks to the present situation these days. Um, okay, so based on everything he's said so far, and we just went through what we just went through in chapter 11, I, I would say that what chapter 11 shows us is cumulatively what is the faith? What is the contents of the faith? Faith is a vision. It includes the promise of the seed of the woman. It includes the blood sacrifice for sin, right? It includes walking with God like Enoch. It includes the rapture like Enoch. It includes the telling of the coming judgment uh, and the escape from judgment. Deliverance from the wrath to come, represented both by Enoch and Noah. It includes God's building, represented by the ark and the tabernacle of Moses. And it includes the good land uh, with the, well, really the new city, Jerusalem. Uh, Abraham looked to a city and whose builder and maker is God, right? The, who, that has foundations. This new city, Jerusalem. It, it includes our destination uh, in the new heavens and the new earth where righteousness dwells. All this is a vision. And then that vision produces a people who, instead of desiring to dwell in Babel or Egypt, end up gladly dwelling in tabernacles like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, or with the tabernacle, like Moses and his people, Moses choosing to endure affliction with the people of Christ rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin and the opportunities in Egypt. It does, faith as a vision, seeing all that God has provided and promised, changes you, the way you face. That is the repentance, the turning about, the change of mind, the about face, where now we're facing the tabernacle, the place of meeting, we're facing God himself, and Egypt is behind us. Or Babel is behind us. So because it changes our position, um, there is a practical separation that happens uh, not by effort. Um, now, God's people, this is not perfect. You know, this is not perfect. Remember, Abraham drifted back into Egypt during the time of the famine. So did uh yeah, there were plenty of times in the Old Testament where there were periods of wandering in silence uh, of the patriarchs who are credited with having left everything behind. But when you go back and read the story, you find out it's a process of God continually having to visit them and strengthen their faith. We see Abraham especially, his faith, it was the God of glory appearing to him. And every time God appeared to him, that infused faith into him so that he was able to carry on. And he would kind of stand still for a while sometimes. And then God would show up, the God of glory, and, and elaborate. The way God infuses faith is to elaborate his promise. He never rebuked, like for example, there was 13 years of silence where after Abraham had Ishmael. God, he, for all intents and purposes, he was backslidden at that point, I think. And then God suddenly appears to him again. And he doesn't bring up his sin. He elaborates his promise. He just picks up where he left off in the conversation and elaborates his promise and gives more detail. More detail, more detail. And as the more detail comes more knowledge of what it is God has in store for you, your faith grows and practically you desire that. And so growth in the Christian life and growth in faith is entirely a matter of vision. And when God fills in the details of what your salvation includes, he's also infusing you with the faith that is keeping you on you know, that's how he gathers you in. Remember, this is all the oath. This is all the high priesthood of Christ. This is all the speaking of God as he infuses himself into you by shining on you. 
And that light comes to you and more knowledge comes. And that is the new and living way that draws you in. It is the anchor of your soul. He is drawing you in by elaborating on his promise, shining on you so that you have a greater and greater vision of what it is God has accomplished for you. And that practically separates you, making you a stranger and a pilgrim here so that you are no longer home in this world. And you say, depending on where you are in that process, there's going to be greater and lesser degrees of manifestation of that separation. But the separation is accomplished. You've been sanctified forever. You've been forever perfected by the blood of Christ. He just wants you to enjoy it. Enjoy what you have. And there will be uh, a weight of glory that's revealed, that's been wrought into you here while you look not to those things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. As you grow in Christ and more of him gets into you through vision, you're supplied with Christ through vision, which is your faith, the vision of the contents of God, of your inheritance, that, uh, that will grow you. So there is variations among God people in terms of how much they grow. And it's all to do with God's grace for you and your appetite, really. And you can slow that process down by sowing to the flesh and never taking interest in what it is God has for you doesn't mean you're not saved. It means you're not enjoying what he has for you and you'll be miserable. If you're saved and you're not enjoying what God has for you, your chances are you're a miserable person. And that's the consequence of sowing to the flesh. You reap corruption from the flesh, but that reaping stops when the flesh stops. So when we're resurrected, there will be no more flesh to reap. So don't worry about that. But God would have you to see what he has in store for you. And that's what he raises up teachers and evangelists for. None of this happens in a vacuum. It's not all just on you. It is the working of the body of Christ. And it's the operation of the measure in each one part that causes the growth. Remember, it's not just the growth of the individuals. It's the growth of the body unto the building up of itself in love. So, Growth is, on the one hand, us increasing in apprehension of what it is that we understand that God has done for us in Christ, but that's through a ministry, and it's through the body, and it's for all of us. So none of us are alone in this, and you don't have to measure yourself against anybody. Just enjoy what God has for you. I hope that's an encouraging word. I, I, I had a little bit of a struggle saying it, but that's how I see Hebrews 11. Um, now, we're entering Hebrews 12. We are enjoying the afflictions of the people of God rather than enjoying the treasures in Egypt. Okay, And these afflictions, as we'll see in the first part of chapter 12, in many cases are related to our contending for the gospel. Um, and let's just read these verses. Wherefore, seeing also that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses that were mentioned in Hebrews 11, for example, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. You've not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And you've forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, or faint when you are rebuked for him. But whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son he receives. If you endure chastening, God is dealing with you as a son. For what son is he whom the Father chastens not? But if you are without chastisement, chastisement therefore whereof all are partakers, then you're bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we had fathers of the flesh that corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Uh, for verily, for a few days they chastened us after their own pleasure, for, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, chastening for the present seems to be joyous, uh, not joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them 
which are exercised thereby. I'll, st- I'll stop here for now. Well, no, let me, let me just continue real quick. Um, Therefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight the paths of your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but rather let it be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, and there be a root of bitterness springing up to trouble you, and many be defiled. Uh, I'll leave it there. Okay, so what's he talking about here? We talked about how vision is the way right that we grow in faith and are supplied with christ god infusing himself by his speaking and that speaking is an elaboration of his promise but on the other hand there's also discipline which is also for your growth and no one escapes it all of us are partakers of discipline but the discipline here is put in context of persecution which is interesting to me Um, first of all, we have all these witnesses, right? And we're to lay aside every weight and sin, which easily besets us and let us run with patience, the race that is set before us. It's interesting running with patience. Usually running means you're running as fast as you can, right? You're out running something. There's no patience involved, but to run with patience, a race that's set before you, you know, some people would say, well, that's a marathon. Okay. Yeah, I, I can see that. I just think it's an interesting turn of phrase. Let us run with patience. We need strength to be patient unto the coming of the Lord to inherit everything he has for us. And patience with ourselves. It's not just patience in general, but I think it's patience with ourselves and patience with the rate that God moves and the and patience with the people around us. Because we are all running together. Uh, This is a group, right? And there's a cloud of witnesses watching us. And we're looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Not just our faith, but the faith. It says ours in italics, our faith, but really it's author and finisher of faith. The faith is something objective. It's all the vision of what he's laid out. The vision of everything that we see in Christ that God's provided for us. That is the faith. It's something objective. It's not the act of believing. The faith is something that the apostles talked about that was an objective thing. Some will depart from the faith, right? Or Jude says, uh, I want you to earnestly contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered. And uh, Peter talks about how we've all obtained like precious faith. It's something that we've received. And that faith has the contents. And the contents are a vision of things that are unseen but clearly promised in the Word. And uh, Jesus is the author (laughs) as the Word. He's the author of this faith. And he's the executor of the inheritance. He's the executor of the will. And the inheritance is the contents of the faith. Um. But he, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. Now think about that. The joy, what is the joy? The joy wasn't for him to just be up in heaven. You know, he didn't have to leave heaven. He was already enjoying that. No, the joy was you and me bringing us into glory as the sons of God. And this, you know, I treasure his foreknowledge of us. I treasure his choosing and predestination. I really do. I'm not a Calvinist, but I do believe that God foreknew those of us who are members of the body of Christ and who have an eternity with the Son as his bride and counterpart, which he's already aware of because he knows all things from the end of the beginning. He exists outside of time and has experienced it all. He he has the memory of ages to come with us that we haven't spent with him yet. But he knows us according to that kind of knowledge. And it's for the joy of beginning this adventure with us and sharing his inheritance with us and bringing us into glory that he despised the shame and is set down at the right hand of God. That's his death and resurrection. He went through all of this to gain us. That's how important we are to him. And for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And I used to think that he was saying that I had to resist sinning 
to the point where I would really be willing to bleed for it. You know, that's not it. What he, this is, is the contradiction of sinners against himself. It's use, it's comparing your resisting, unto, uh, st- you're striving against sin. It's comparing striving against sin with the contradiction of sinners against himself, I believe. And that is persecution. That, on the one hand, it's persecution. And on the other hand, it's the feel, you know, if there's anything that bothers me in my Christian life right now, it is the false teachers. The YouTube drama of all the people who are departing from the faith. It wearies me. It really does. It makes me want to faint in my mind. It is overwhelming. And I think about it a lot. That is, if you are a servant of the Lord and a believer, you are engaged in this race. And we're running together and we see people running off to the left and the right, dropping out of the race. And that is the contradiction of sinners against Christ. What what do you mean they ran off they fell off of the race. Well, they stopped believing or they came up with a contrary truth and now they've departed. They're no longer assembling together with us as the habit of, you know, some, they, they, they've disappeared. They're back at the temple. They're back looking for some other way to satisfy their conscience than the blood of Christ. And that is a contradiction of sinners against Christ that can be wearying and cause us to faint in our minds. And so when he says, you have not resisted unto blood striving against sin, I think he's talking about that whole situation. He's talking to the believers who are staying true to the faith and watching so many depart. And those who were departing were now persecuting them and saying, no, you have to get back to the temple. You have to get back to the sacrifices. You've abandoned Moses. I mean, remember James and the brothers in Acts 21 demanded that Paul take a vow in the temple to show that he had not apostatized from Moses and walked orderly, keeping the law. The pressure was so great from the godliest people. James is considered the most godly person in Jerusalem. Even the Pharisees respected him. He is his, He's called James the Just, and there's legends about how he prayed on his knees for hours, and he seemed to be so spiritual. And yet what he was contending for there was a pressure. I mean, think about it. You're being told, and I believe this is Paul. I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. And it's, uh, there's the reference to, you know, you took, you took pity on me and compassion on my bonds. That sounds like Paul to me. Um, but anyway, uh, I know he went to the Gentiles, so maybe it was somebody else, but I, I, it's definitely Pauline revelation. Only Paul who had been taken to the third heavens, would have been able to see all these realities about the high priesthood of Christ and really understand the scripture in this light. I I believe this is Pauline. But the point I'm making is that... Boy, my ADD is bad today. I'm sorry. Um, The point I'm making is that that would have been an incredible pressure. The pressure from Jerusalem to stay centered in Moses when we're totally being told through the ministry of the New Testament to move on to the more excellent ministry of Christ and there's a new priesthood and there's a new and it's all in resurrection and it's all invisible and it has nothing to do with the temple and it has nothing to do with the ironic priesthood and the sacrifices and those who are deviating from this are just like the people today who say you've got to go back to the law and no you can't abandon Moses and you have to listen to I'm a red letter Christian all the stuff we see the grace deniers this was grace denying but in a even more, I mean, people could be stoned to death. It was a much more intense thing than even what we experience today. And that's what they were striving against. The sin, remember in Hebrews 10, the willful sin we talked about would be departing from God's revelation that he revealed in Christ and going back to what he had revealed before in shadows and saying those are the reality and Christ is is an unclean thing and and his grace doesn't do anything you know i gotta go back to these other things that's what we're talking about okay now and then he says and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as children my son despise not the chastening of the lord 
nor faint when you are rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son that he receives. What is this? Well, he is clearly putting the discipline of the Lord in the context of the contradiction of sinners against himself and against these people. This is a discipline from the Lord, not because you've done something bad. When God disciplines you, it is not because you've done necessarily done something bad, that you're in trouble now. No, it, it can be, but you have to be disciplined anyway to grow and partake of God. And, you know, if everything was cozy and everything was fine and there was nothing to contend for, would we grow in grace as fast as we are? Right now, among the grace community, the truth is shining very clearly because we're being forced to contend for the gospel in the light of all of this contradiction, which is tending to weary and weigh us out and it causes us to faint in our minds. But we haven't resisted the blood striving against all this, and yet we're so tired of it, so sick of it, just want to go home. That's why we need patience to run the race, right? And <laughs> so he calls this a discipline. The discipline is very interesting, and it does purify our motives. It causes you to, it causes you to, it has reduced me. You know, I could do a whole thing on the Nephilim. I could do a whole, I and I started to, when I first started this channel, I did a whole thing on church history, and I was, uh, you know, talking about trends in the apostatizing church, and I got to uh, getting to talk about Thyatira, and I was talking about Jezebel, and then, well, that took me to act of Nimrod, well, that took me to, he became a Gibberim, well, that brings into the Nephilim, and I was going to talk about the mystery religions and all that stuff, and God said no, and it was clear because that was what, what was important is I had to contend for grace. I didn't have time to get into all that, and I knew it would be a tangent. I knew that I had to run a race that was very specific to contend for the grace of God. That's what we're doing now. And so discipline makes you single. So you can't just wander around doing whatever you want. It reduces the dead weight, the sins, and the things that so easily encumber us and hinder us, the weights. All these things get dropped off, and the thing that becomes most important is contending for the gospel. It simplifies you, simplifies you and makes you single. That's what a discipline is for. And as we're single, we are sanctified too. I'm partaking more of Christ through all this than I have in the last 15 years of my Christian life. And that is due to his chastening. Now, the chastening also can be grievous, especially because he does have to deal with sin in our nature. He has to deal with my motives and he has to deal with our everything. Because he has to, as we contend for the truth, you know, I get angry at these people and I want to insult them <laughs> and I don't always handle it correctly. And then I have to repent and I have to, I have to, you know, and, and there's been a couple times where it's like, I really had to repent. And before I did this channel, I was brought into a season of pruning where God, I felt like I was godly sorrow over every area of my Christian life. I mean, I, it just didn't stop, and it went on for like a month. I felt I just felt like crying every day. I didn't know he was preparing me to do something. I didn't even have a YouTube channel in mind. And then one day I was so down that I had to preach the gospel to myself, so I lifted up the camera and did it in the camera because I'd seen a Rene Roland video. I'm like, I might be able to do something like that, you know? But I didn't think it was going to turn into something, really. Uh, but I can see now that all that ch chastening and pruning was to set me on the course so I would know what's important. And I need the gospel of grace. So that's the chastening. It's in the it's put in the context here of the persecution. I just think that's very interesting. Um, if you're without chase now, but also there's an inward regulation that we need where we learn to fear God and we learn, you know, he does deal with us. There is a negative sense of it's not just the persecution, it's also the purifying of your own motives and bringing you into the fear of the Lord, right? Furthermore, we had fathers of the flesh which corrected us. We gave them reverence. Shall we not much be rather to the subject to the father of spirits and live? 
Uh, it makes us alive. It quickens us. For verily, for a few days, they chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. See, when parents, like when I punish my kids, I'm angry sometimes, and I want to deal with it right now. And it's more for my satisfaction that I know he got it, and he ain't going to do that thing again, because that really makes me mad. The, you know, that is not how God does it. God, when he disciplines, does it in supreme wisdom and grace knowing exactly what we need. And I know that the scariest discipline is when he's silent. You don't even know you're going through it. He just lets you go and explore something that's repugnant to him, but you're blind to it. And it he lets it fester until it becomes such a big problem that you can't deal with it, that, 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 you, that you're starting to even see it, right? And then finally he strikes a blow and you can never go back to that thing again. And he does it in the perfect timing. He might wait years to discipline you about something that you were blind to. He's done that in my life plenty of times, several times. Uh, okay, so anyway, but he does it for our profit, not out of anger, never out of anger. It's never for his own sake to get you to get some sense of justice, to punish you for the sake of justice. No, it's always for your training. To make you a partaker of his holiness. And no, it doesn't seem to be pre presently joyous. It, gr it grieves you. But afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those that are exercised thereby. I'm in a season right now. After all that pruning I went through last year, man, I've really enjoyed the grace of God this year. I've really had a peace. And he's, I've been in a season of fruitfulness. Now, he could prune me again, you know. I hope not. I mean, I, I, but I, he says, if you bear fruit, he's going to prune you again. This is just the way it goes. This is what he does with his children. And this is what we say to those who are sinful. You know, they say, well, you just want a license for sin. No, we know God disciplines his children, and we don't want that discipline, and yet it's going to come. He's going to purify us. But then he says, wherefore, lift up the hands that hang down and the feeble knees. See, they are just starting to really fade because of all the contradiction of sinners. Still, he's really talking about the contradiction of sinners. The people who are abandoning grace and going back to the temple and then persecuting them and resisting them and demanding that they do the same and then finding themselves having to keep having the same arguments again and again and again, right? And, find, and then wondering if they're wrong and wondering if they're right. You see, it's in that time of the arguing that you start to go, well, maybe they're right, maybe I'm wrong. That's when God really purifies your heart because you, you get desperate. You're like, I don't want to fall away. Please don't let me be deceived. Maybe I'm wrong. And then God purifies you and clarifies the truth. And that's part of his discipline. But that their hands were hanging down and their knees had become feeble, you know, but they needed to keep running. And so he says, make straight the paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Uh, in other words, don't let this offend you. Don't get carried away with offense in this fight. That's how I see that. Because then he says, follow peace with all men and holiness without mix no one shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God and a root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Now, here, I'll just give a warning that, you know, people on my wall have been taking shots at grace teachers that they don't like. Like, Tim Henderson is a big target for some reason, and I really appreciate how he clarified his message today. I'm right on board with him. There's people who come to me and said, well, what about this and this and this? And that looks like Illuminati and he wears this thing and that, you know, can you, if, if you can't fault his teaching, you need to let go of the bitterness or whatever it is offending you where you're starting to try to dig and try to get into the rumor mill and find out a reason to dislike him. And the, re and the way I, I'll warn about this was because I had a sister who was running along with me, and I can still see her on my channel. I can go back and look at the comments, and she was a grace believer. I could swear she was a grace believer. Contending for truth, appreciating truth, but in an email thread we had with her, she was offended at Tim Henderson. 
and she just could not stand him and she kept bringing it up and bringing it up and we'd say look you don't have to talk to him if you don't you don't have to watch his videos if you don't like him move on and she just couldn't let it go and she kept accusing him of more and more stuff and then per, of personal stuff he didn't she didn't like his tone of voice she didn't like his politics she didn't like the way he sat with his wife she didn't like it. i mean it always just going on about tim henderson and finally she started we knew that this was bad we were emailing each other saying gosh she's really out of control with this thing it's her heart it's, it's, i don't know why she's so offended and then she started to argue against grace and and we tried had to try to argue and say no you know the, the grace is the way you know and she's like no you guys are just wanting a license to sin at least the legalists are willing to try i couldn't believe it anyway she said she had to extract herself from the conversation then she disappears for a couple of weeks and then i see her on some legalists boards on their youtube channels and she's commenting and she's like a completely different person she has completely hardened herself against the grace of god and is now teaching against eternal security teaching against once saved always saved teaching against the, a sealing of the spirit accusing people like us of being servants of the devil she went down a path because of her personal offense with this guy that led her into a root of bitterness that sprang up. And then I made the mistake of calling her out on the YouTube channel, even though I didn't mention her by name. I don't, I, and I have to bring this up again, but I should have done that, I guess, because then she went and she sicked some YouTube channels on me and I had some dogs doing videos about me. And it was just like, wow, this is really and then i was tempted to get really mad and offended and and i got sick that's right when i got sick about my stomach issues and everything it was all related to that whole thing and this was and i had to purify my i had to repent of being mad at these people and i had to pray for them and what i prayed real personally for a couple of them um based on things I'd seen in their videos and, and prayed for their personal needs and did my best to release them to let God deal with them. But that was a root of bitterness that sprang up as someone fell short of the glory of the grace of God, right? And it was all based on her offense about Tim Henderson. Now, I'm not saying Tim Henderson is don't touch my anointed or anything like that. What I'm saying is Unless someone is actually teaching against the grace of God, stay away from the accusations. Do not get on that train. If you don't like somebody's personality or something, don't get on that train. Don't let the offense carry you away. I've seen it actually happen and it scared me. She fell off the race over that issue, you know, and I don't know where she is today, but at this point she denies grace. Now, if she was genuinely saved, I have no idea, you know. But that's the contradiction of sinners that can wear you out, and it's the root of bitterness that can spring up and defile everyone. And all of this, at the same time, was a chastening from God. It was a discipline from the Lord for me to grow. I had to be enlarged through that experience. In the future, I'm not going to ever bring up a sister like this in a video. Now, this I have. To, I feel like I have to talk about this today, so I'm bringing it up. But, um, and I know she won't. You know, I'm not mentioning her by name. Nobody would even know who I'm talking about. But the point is that this really this stuff is real and follow peace with all men and holiness without which no one should see the Lord looking diligently lest any man fail short of the grace of God lest the root of bitterness spring up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. This is all related to the discipline of the Lord in the face of the contradiction of sinners who are apostatizing from grace. This is the situation we find ourselves in. We need to embrace God's discipline especially since it's preparing us for the rapture. We're right there. Okay. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person is Esau, who for one morsel or meat sold his birthright. And afterwards he had inherited the blessing. Uh, he would have inherited the blessing. He was rejected for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Even though he sorrow. See, that shows me that sorrow is not the same thing as repentance repentance is laying hold of christ in faith and being secure in your inheritance that's what repentance is sorrow and seeking with tears what you've lost doesn't get it for you judas had that and he that didn't produce actual repentance when he went and killed himself and regretted betraying the lord and everything didn't matter um 
and a fornicator here, you, he's not, I don't think he's talking directly about sexual immorality, although obviously that's a problem, but this is someone considered profane because they exchange the spiritual for a morsel of meat, right? He's willing to sell his birthright. He despised the birthright. And that's the same thing as falling short of the grace of God and apostatizing from it. These are Esau. They're twins to Isaac. Or, I'm sorry, twins to Jacob. But Jacob is the one who ends up with the promise. Looks just like him. It's the wheat and the tares. And the tares will eventually be manifested as sinners that contradict Christ and the gospel. And they'll be used uh, by God in his sovereignty to discipline his children and make them partakers of the holiness. This is part of the scourging that he, we undergo is dealing with these people and not fainting and having to be re-strengthened and set the path straight and follow peace and repent of the anger and stay out of the bitterness and pray for them and all that stuff makes us sons of God, not just in position, but also this is talking somewhat about dispositional work of God in our hearts to really transform us, okay? Uh, and bring us into the atmosphere of Zion, which is what he's going to talk about next, and I'll get to that in the next part. Hopefully this was clear. Um, all right, talk to you later.